All right, Admin of Code 2020, day 24, lobby layout. Uh, hex grid, oh boy. We have six directions which are like this. Uh, and so the question is how do you uh, deal with a hex grid? So I believe just have like diagonal rows and horizontal columns kind of. useful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here we have um, is x plus equals 1, uh, y minus equals 1. Uh, this is uh, y minus equals 1, c plus equals 1. Uh, and then we have uh, x Times equals one, C plus equals one. Plus, uh, how do I do this? This is X minus equals one and Y plus equals one. Northwest. Uh, C minus equals one, Y plus equals one. Just like this. And northeast, we have uh, X plus one and Z minus one. Oh. 
169. Nice. Uh, those people were fast on that. Okay. This is after a hundred days. Zero or more than two. I don't understand what the starting set is supposed to be. Also, how big is the lobby? Is it infinitely big? So we need to check some white tiles. Uh, X, Y, and Z. 
Six six seven. Cool. Okay. Uh, so that went reasonably well. Um, so that's nice. <laughs> a couple of updates. Uh, so what's going on? Um, so we have this hex grid, uh, and so basically the question is about finding good coordinate and neighborhood systems for hex grids. Uh, I imagine that people who did well on this have thought about hex grids before. Uh, I have thought about hex grids before. I wrote a game that uses a hex grid. Um, and so I did not remember exactly what the coordinate system was, but I did remember that this nice website exists, which is like really good for hex grid stuff. Uh, and in particular, they have a coordinate system right here, um, which was fortunate. Uh, how did I even get here? Search for hex grid and it was the first entry. Cool. Um, so I'm just using their coordinate system, uh, which um, uses three coordinates, but they always add to zero. So it's really a 2D coordinate system, which makes sense because the hex grid is on a plane, which is a 2D object. Uh, anyway, it's three coordinates and uh, it uniquely identifies um, a point with these three coordinates. And, uh, you know, I just wrote down the six neighbor pairs, basically. Um, so for part one, uh, we're just sort of following these instructions. Um, and there's no uh, spaces or anything, so you just have to, you know, it, it uniquely decodes though, right? Um, if it's S, if it starts with an S, then it must be one of these two. If it starts with an N, it must be one of these two and their length two. And if it starts with E, you know, if it's E or W, then that's a direction. Um, so anyway, we sort of repeatedly decode and erase uh, letters. Um, and, you know, this, I just sort of, copied off of this coordinate system. I guess it would have been faster if I, you know, knew it by hand, uh, but I didn't. Um, so, you know, we delete one letter for east and west and the first two letters for the directions that are two letters long. Um, and so we follow each of these paths uh, in the input and gets us to some square and then we just toggle whether or not uh, that square is on. So part one, we're just supposed to print um, the, uh, the number of squares that are on. And then in part two, we're sort of doing like another cellular automaton Conway's Game of Life kind of thing. Uh, so my solution is very similar to the previous problem uh, that was like that, I forget what day it was. Um, I initially forgot to check nearby white squares and itched into nearby black squares. So that was uh, pretty silly of me, caused me to lose some time debugging. Um, but yeah, so basically the idea is that you need to uh, know what this array of neighbor directions is um, so I just sort of copied down, you know, this thing as tuples. Uh, possibly it would have been wiser to, you know, make this a list somewhere and then this could be like indexing into this list or something. I don't know. Anyway, this was fine. Uh, so any square that is a neighbor of a square that is active could potentially become active in the next step. So we need to check through all of them. And then for all the squares that we're checking, uh, go through its neighbors, and if they're active, you know, count that, um, and then just apply the rules. Uh, some slight confusion on my part because this is a rule for when a black tile becomes white, and I want a rule for when a black tile becomes black, so you just need to negate this part. Uh, right, if it's zero or more than two, then it becomes white, so if it's one or two, then it stays black. Um, and if it was white and there are two adjacent, then it becomes black, so that's that rule. Um, the other thing that is easy to get tripped up here is the simultaneously part. So you need to, right, I'm, I'm not modifying B as I go through this loop. I'm just adding things to this new B set. And then I replace B with new B. Um, and that's what makes it uh, simultaneous, right? Is I'm doing the replacement all at once. Um, and these checks are all using the old uh, tiles. Um, I thought it was somewhat unclear what the starting set of tiles for this automaton was supposed to be, but I don't know. I guess maybe it's sort of obvious that it's the answer to whatever tiles you got from part one. Uh, anyway, that turns out to be true. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much there is all there is to say about this problem. Um, just a question basically of getting the directions in the hex grid, right? You need that 
the part one, obviously, to interpret the directions, and then also in part two, because you need the proper neighbor array. Um, I think there's other ways of sort of giving coordinates to a hex grid. You know, this like Greek coordinates for a two-dimensional thing is a bit weird, but anyway, this one's nice um, and easy to Google, so that's nice too. Uh, so that's it for day 24.